Well, indeed, being a dad is no joke, but there are jokes involved, certainly. And around my household, my kids wish that there were not. Pastor Dennis was telling me that he didn't tell any dad jokes in his household whatsoever. I don't believe him. It's just, it's just wired. It's something that we can't help but doing. Whew, happy Father's Day. Pastor Dennis walked out and he turned around and saw this little, um, this little bag of goodies on the door as he was heading out. That was his Father's Day gift. Thus far, my Father's Day gift is just being able to be here with you this morning. Pastor Kevin and I just kind of consider a spiritual father that he would give me permission to come and address you on, on such a great day. So it's a great Father's Day gift for me. I hope it is in some sense to you as well. We'll know in about 25 minutes. <laughs> but as Pastor Dennis pointed out, this past Sunday afternoon, we gathered at Del Monte Beach and we witnessed and celebrated the baptism of almost 20 of our Shoreline family. And actually, I've chosen this little set of pictures because it is a family of four who were all baptized. Dad led the way. And what a great Father's Day gift that had to be for his whole family being uh, baptized on that day. It was a little windy and the water was a bit on the chilly side, but we were undeterred. So what's going on here? Why are these people doing this? And so here at Shoreline, I need to explain to you, we practice a believer's baptism. Those who are baptized, regardless of their age, young or old, they've made a profession of faith that they have accepted Jesus' invitation to be part of his forever family. Now, we could wrestle over the words and definitions, but the bottom line is, is that we recognize our sinfulness and our need of a Savior. We've identified that Jesus is indeed that Savior, and we've placed our faith and our trust in him. And by those pictures you explain, according to what we see in God's word, we are obedient to the call to be baptized as an outward expression of an inward decision. And so those who were baptized this past week, uh, those who we might have, say, have experienced faith. Uh, they have a first-hand personal experience with the living God. And so I'm going to talk to us about four generations of faith, faith levels, if you will, when we start with that first-hand faith, what can happen if we are not intentional about moving into the next generation? So that first generation of an experienced faith, uh, people can come to that experienced faith in many different ways. For myself, it was March 4th, 1984. It was a Sunday evening uh, uh, communion service at church. And uh, I tell you, I had grown up in the church. I certainly had an understanding of all the Bible stories. And, and we spent a lot of time there. We had great times there. I had good friends. But I, through that uh, elementary age time, there was no real understanding of I could have this personal relationship with Christ uh, as a middle schooler and a high schooler, I wasn't found around church at all. When Barb and I got married, we turned back to the church, and we got a better understanding. We connected with a church who was really, uh, who was, was really salvation-minded, and they, they taught us, and, and I got it, but I didn't get it until March 4th, 1984, when that particular evening, I knew that I knew that I knew that Christ died for me. And wanted that personal relationship with me. And that started for me, if you will, an experienced faith. Not depth of experience. That comes after years and years and years. And he's still working on me and has a long way to go. But by his grace, he continues to shape me and mold me in the man that he wants me to become. But that first generation of experienced faith are those who have personal trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. So when, you're, when you are a household of an experienced faith, uh, then the next generation comes along and they automatically assume an inherited faith. You're born into a faith family and you may go to church, you may go to Sunday school classes, you may learn all of those stories, you may have good friends and may be great times and all that, but you may never move to that point where you make a personal faith decision. Well, let's just chat about that for a minute. If you're, when you're born in the hospital, that does not make you a doctor. You're born in the garage. If that took place, it would not make you a car. So being born into a Christian family does not make you a Christ follower necessarily. You've inherited your faith, and there needs to be a move back to that first generation of personal experience faith. 
Uh, Likewise, if you happen to be born into an inherited faith household, then you are more than likely to adopt what we might call a convenient faith. It's the place where you go, you you rely upon the church, or the place you go to be married. It's the place you go to celebrate or mourn the loss of a life, marry and bury. So they're like these booking things that happen in an adult life. Uh, It's the place you go because you're supposed to attend on Christmas and Easter, and those are the right things to do. Uh, You might open your Bible occasionally and, and look in through some things, but you attack your faith from a matter of convenience. And when tough times come, when trouble comes, when crisis arises, you run to the church because you just kind of innately sense that you need to run to God and have him help you out of this, kind of a foxhole faith, if you will. But when crisis is averted and things calm down and situation is smoothed over, it's kind of back to business as usual. And so faith becomes a matter of convenience. Your connection to God is convenience and crisis. So if you are born into a convenient faith, household that is a convenient faith, uh, pardon me, if we understand that being born into a household of convenient faith, then there's a pretty good chance that faith for you will become a nuisance. It's that thing I have to do on Christmas. It's that thing I have to do on Easter. It's the thing we have to do at these particular points in our lives. And more than likely what happens is that on Sunday morning, mom and or dad are dressed up and have their best foot forward. But from Sunday afternoon to Saturday night, it's anything but a faithful house household that you live in. And so as you look at that, you say, this is bogus. There's nothing to this. I'm out of here. And you check out. And those times where you do have to come, it's you show up on Christmas Eve and you can see the mental eye roll that takes place in people sometimes as they come in where they are, if not physically dragged in, they are emotionally dragged in by mom or dad or some family member or friend that says, you got to come to this thing. At worst, it can be Uh, that they just walk away from faith in spite of their fathers. I just kind of think about the the words that uh, the psalmist in Psalm 1, he says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, having moved away from godly counsel of his family and friends, who stands in the way of sinners, the company of that, and who sits in the seat of mockers, where actually now you've moved to a point in life for that The person who does those things where now uh, the things of God become derided and, uh, and anything but celebrated. So generations of faith from an experienced faith, an inherited faith, a convenient faith, or a faith that is downright nuisance. Let me ask you this morning just for a moment, where are you in faith level? What generation of faith do you find yourself in? And where do you want to be? And what do you want for the generation to come after you? And that's what we're going to talk about here for a little bit this morning. But I want to go back to that baptism just for a minute. The church refers to baptism as a sacrament. It's an act that is sacred and it is set apart. Now, baptism is a rite, R-I-T-E, undertaken by those who are squarely in that first-generation relationship with Jesus. It's both solemn and it's celebratory all at the same time. Now, a few weeks back, we carved out time in our morning worship service to celebrate another practice in the church, child dedication. It is not a sacrament, but rather it's a time that we ask God's blessing on the child and God's empowering and equipping upon the parents as they point their child in God's direction. And the decision to become a first-generation believer is squarely on the individual, the next generation after every first-generation believer. But moms and dads both have opportunity and responsibility for grand impact upon the next generation. Now, if you happen to be at the third service a couple of weeks ago, you would have witnessed the dedication of Rowan Timothy Curtis Pack. 
just before we went downstairs to be ready for the dedication come out from the back here, I asked Jesse and Angie if there was any significance to the name Rowan. It's an unusual name. I don't know any other Rowans. In fact, and if you're old enough, the only Rowan probably you know is Dan Rowan and Dick Martin. And, well, that doesn't bring up anything that seems godly. <laughs> but anyway, I asked about Rowan, and they said, no, nah, we just like the name. But the name Curtis, however, did have story behind it. And it all started with this little girl. I caught up with Jesse earlier this week, and I wanted to talk to him a little bit more about this. And I'd love you to check out our conversation. It'll be here on video. Hey, so Jesse, a couple of weeks ago, we dedicated Rowan, Timothy, Curtis, Peck. That's right. Uh, so That's tell right. me, there's a little story behind Curtis. Uh, tell, me, tell me about that. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. My uh, great-grandmother on my dad's side, so my dad's dad's mother was a poor orphan named Marie. He was fostered by a man uh, whose name was Curtis and um, brought her up to know the Lord. Um, she didn't, she wasn't a believer before then, but this man Curtis um, basically introduced the gospel to my great grandmother. So she in turn named her firstborn son, my grandfather, um, after this man. So his full name was William Curtis Pack. My grandfather was a pastor basically his entire life um, as, a, as an immediate consequence of um, the faith that was handed down to him by his mother, who was handed to her by this man, Curtis. Um, uh, he had a number of children. His firstborn son's name is Danny Curtis Pack. That's my uncle. Um, Danny had no sons of his own. So um, my father named me his firstborn son, Jesse Curtis Pack. So that's my full name, Jesse Curtis Pack. And so um, when I became a father to a son a few months ago, um, it was my pleasure to um, hand on the name to another generation. So I named my child Rowan Timothy Curtis Pack, um, Curtis obviously being the family name, um, honoring this man who introduced our family to the faith, and um, Timothy in honor of his grandfather um, who helped propagate that. Strong legacy of faith in my family that I'm um, happy to be, happy to have, happy to be part of. Tell me, when did you first discover the significance of your middle name? Uh, it was one of those stories that I grew up with. And, you know, when you're a kid and you you probably don't, you know, give these things the kind of weight that they deserve. You know, like when you hear the Christmas story as a kid, or you hear the Easter story as a kid, you're just like, mm-hmm, yeah, that's how it went. Um, so it's sort of, I think it's something that has become more special the older that I've gotten and the more that I've meditated on the consequence of that man's actions in my life and in the life of my family and everyone that I know. How do you see the impact of the weight of that? What has that meant to you from a personally from a faith standpoint? Uh, the weight of it is, I mean, it's a good weight, I guess. Um, you know, the Bible talks about how a good name is more precious than silver and gold. And so I think having a name that um, is so meaningful is a, uh, uh, it's sort of a lot of responsibility in some ways, I guess, but it's also just a real blessing to know what I'm connected to <laughs> by consequence of that name. <laughs> uh, well, we certainly celebrate uh, Marie's foster dad, Curtis, right. and the impact <laughs> that he's had upon a generation of packs. Absolutely. Matt, thanks. Sure. Well, the packs are bent on continuing this legacy of faith that was launched by the faithfulness of a foster father who made sure to point his temporary charge to her heavenly father with very long-term result. So with our remaining time this morning, I'd like to offer up what I might consider to be four faith levers, a principle for living purposefully predisposed to pass on our faith. And I just need you to know that this is not just for moms and dads. Who's the next generation in your sphere of influence? Is it a niece or a nephew? Is it a grandson, granddaughter? Uh, maybe you've got a small group uh, and one of the families has got kids in that and you have opportunity for life touch upon them. I want you to think just for a moment before we launch into this, who do you personally have impact upon that would be, if not generationally, uh, uh, of an age generationally, but would be a next generation faith that you could have impact upon as we walk through these things together. And allow me to give credit to Kurt Bruner from Home Point Ministries for his insights into these categories as we explore these four levers or four principles for passing a first-generation faith on 
to the next generation. Well, as we saw in the video, the Pax have a legacy of faith way behind them and intend to continue the legacy of faith into the next generations. And legacy, indeed, I think is a faith lever, and it's also a biblical mandate. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the uh, book of Deuteronomy records an extended conversation that Moses has with the nation's Israel as they're poised to enter the promised land. And at least three times, Moses', Moses admonishment goes something like this. Uh, listen up, I'm going to give you God's rules for healthy living, and I'm going to remind you of his provision up to this point. Uh, don't forget what he's shown us, don't forget what he's told us, and whatever you do, don't forget to tell your children. Now, in chapter 4, he says it like this, it's here on the screen, he says, be careful and watch yourselves closely, so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen, or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Now, about 400 years later, the psalm writers are active, and one of David's choir directors includes within his body of work Psalm 78. And in it, he makes clear the concept of legacy and generational responsibility, and he puts it like this. He commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them. God's precepts and laws, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Now, I believe that in this passage, we're looking at at least four generations here. Uh, the ancestors are generation one, and he's talking about the generation that Moses addressed way back in the book of Deuteronomy. The second one is their children, generation two. The next generation, we could consider that to be the same group, except it includes the children yet to be born, which implies a third generation that we're talking about here in this passage. And they, that third generation, would in turn tell their children, generation four. But it's not just for information's sake that the psalmist says this needs to be done, he declares that this would lead to action on their part, and so we need to look at the next verse that comes along. They would, then they would put their trust in God, they would have heart knowledge, and they would not forget his deeds, they would have head knowledge, but they would keep his commands. There would be action points with their hands, the living out of their lives. So I see this legacy principle as being predominantly a personal thing. I think it starts with us afresh with each new generation as we make sure that we're in that first generation of experienced faith and that we have personally made that move into a relationship with Christ. Only then can we even begin to live out under the promises of God and the power of his provision for us and begin to think about moving it out beyond there. Well, I also see legacy as an intentional mindset which looks beyond our present generation and way beyond that, even as far as the fourth generation, if we can think at that level. So grandparents, this is a great time for us to recognize God's challenge and charge to us to reach beyond our immediate next generation and look down the road and down line for generations to come. Uh, I don't see legacy um, like in this quote I read in yesterday's newspaper in one of the puzzles. It said, a father is a man who expects his son to be as good a man as he meant to be. But rather, in my nine years at Shoreline here, legacy mindset and mission has been modeled for me in two of your pastors. Uh, Pastor Kevin has shown that in his writing, in his interactions with his boys, that it's absolutely clear that he has, has throughout his lifetime, has intentionally point, pointed his boys to know, love, and serve God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Pastor Dennis has, for me, been this grand example for what it's like to lean into your grandchildren with great intentionality about the things of God. And I'm grateful for both of those men for what they have modeled for me. It's come across in countless conversations and observations over a long period of time. And so I ask you this morning, who's demonstrated that for you 
in your life? And is there someone right down there, and perhaps when you get a chance this afternoon, to just drop them a line and say, thank you for what you've shown me in, uh, from your life that I would move forward in mind. So if the legacy principle is a mindset, the likelihood principle, the next one, the likelihood principle is faith in action. It's interacting for impact. And I think the Apostle Paul captures this in one sentence. In the book of Ephesians, if we turn to chapter 6 and we look at verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Well, uh, I don't know. Whatever was behind Paul's admonition to call dads to tone it down and refocus, it seems clear that through the whole sections of chapters 5 and 6, that relationship is in order. That's what he's got in mind. He's talking about husbands and wives, uh, children and parents, and other relationships as he goes through those chapters. In each case, he exhorts that all parties would honor relationship. And without that, it's very difficult for us to lean in with a legacy mindset if we can't establish that relationship at first. So in verse 4, it's like he says, Dads, when you lean into the life of your child, lighten up. Love them into a lasting relationship with the living God. Tell them of his purposes and his provisions for their lives. i got to tell you, across town this morning in the PG campus, in fact, right now, Pastor Nate's in the middle of his message, and we're both on this topic. And this is a dad who has only got about three years' experience under his belt. But he's already shown a strong sense of being the nurturer for young Kingston and for Princeton. I mean, Cardiff. So I ask you, who is your example in this area of this likelihood principle? Someone has shown that they value relationship over rules, but by no means make the rules irrelevant. Is there anybody that's modeled that? The third principle we could look at is the lens principle. And how we see it matters. Now, I've worn corrective lenses going back to, I don't know, sixth or seventh grade. I just always had them. And if I take these off, I can kind of see you. But even down to the front row, I cannot recognize a single soul without these on. I mean, it's just a blur. And I think more and more today, we're living in a time when the lines are blurred. And there is just this erosion of our cultural moors where everything seems to be shifting and changing. And we must keep before our eyes and for those that we wish to influence before us, we need to give them lens that they can be able to see clearly of what is ahead. And if we don't provide those lenses, I think we're in great danger that the next generation will end up like what's recorded in the book of Judges. If we look at Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, after that whole generation, and the generation that we're talking about is the generation of Joshua, whom Moses spoke to when he delivered his words that we find recorded in Deuteronomy, that that entire generation of Joshua's, when they disappeared, after they'd been gathered to their fathers, there was another generation who grew up who neither knew the Lord or what he had done for Israel. And as you read through the book of Judges, you see over 20 chapters, Israel goes into this this mode of self-reliance. We don't need him. And then they go into the suffering. The stuff comes upon them from all sides. And they move into supplication to God and they say, oh, help us. And God brings them security and only for them to head off in the same realm once again and over again, over again, seven cycles We see in the book of Judges where they have just said, we don't need that, but we need that. No, we don't need that. So we need to explore what is the lens through which we look at life? How are we filtering? What brings us vision and clarity to a faith-focused life? And there's a few things that we can talk about, things that they're common. We talk about them a lot in the church. We need to look through the lens of God's word, whether it's bite-sized pieces like that 
Fathers, don't exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, we can take it in larger chunks like we've done over the last eight weeks as we've gone through the books of the Bible, reading them through in chronological order, which was just such a great exercise to just a whack on the head to kind of look at how the New Testament unfolded in, in real time, if you will. Uh, but, or that we look at the epic scope of Scripture and we understand from beginning to end God's grand redemptive story that includes you and me. But we must keep that lens before ourselves and we must keep it before those that we care to influence. We can use the lens of a faith-formed prayer life that we have this relational conversation with our Father and not as some distant entity that has no interest in, it, in us. But the closer we stand to Him, the more intimate we can understand His designs and His desires for our lives. And then we need the lens of faith-filled friends, people who can hang out around us, encourage us when times get tough, celebrate with us when things are awesomeness. Sorry, Dennis. I know, he doesn't like us to use that word. What are the perspectives you place before your kids? If you like, you can borrow the ones that we use for our curriculum upstairs. Um, these three things permeate every part of program for preschoolers. These three phrases, God made me, God loves me, Jesus wants to be my friend forever. In the elementary age, our curriculum is designed around these three, these three statements here. I can trust God no matter what. I need to make the wise choice and I should treat others the way I want to be treated. Now, I tell you, there are a lot of people in my life who have set examples in these things for me, that they have worked through appropriate lens and show that lens to others as well. But there is none who has been as solid and systematic in this as my friend and coworker upstairs, Carolyn Lechie, who is our preschool director. From our earliest days of us working together out at Cypress Church just down the road, she's shown what it's like to look at it at everyday life through the lenses of the divine. How about for you? Who's provided that in your life and who set that example? I hope that you have one. So we've talked about legacy, we've talked about likelihood and lenses. Our final lever is learning. And we want to look at how do we teach to reach. Now, there are at least three areas of learning we could talk about this morning. We could talk about learning capacity so that what is the child's ability to process at a particular age or stage? We could talk about learning styles. Are they primarily auditory learning, learners? Are they visual learners? Are they kinesthetic learners? Or some other form of learning that is their particular wiring? Or we could talk about situational. What are the opportunities of the day and how do we leverage those for learning? And that final one is where we're going to spend our time and we're going to finish up here back in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, with some words that Moses gives. And he's this firm admonishment that he's given to Israel, don't forget the commands of God. And for a second time, he reminds them, we've got to pass these things on to our children. But in this last little passage here, Deuteronomy 6, verse 7, he includes methodology. He gives us a working framework of things that we can do to build into that. And he says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. And these methods are wonderfully suited for family life. Now, even a frenzied pace of our family's lives today, these instructions will benefit anybody that's got a legacy mindset looking on to the future, a likelihood action plan, and the right lenses in place. And we can take these four modes and work them to our great advantage and to the advantage of our children and the generations to come. There's four words in here, four phrases. The first one is when you sit at home. And this might, might be more formal or a structured period of time or just time that's carved out to sit and talk. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a little tool that, that we're using around here. It comes from Focus on the Family, and I think there's going to be a screenshot of it here in a minute. Uh, and it's, it's essentially just an app on your phone that you can pull up by uh, age and gender a series of questions you can scroll through is called Make Every Day Count. Uh, a series of questions you can scroll through and just choose a question 
as you're sitting down for dinner or just lounging in the living room or even to squeeze in during a commercial. And as you pull up the questions, it just prompts you to, to have some conversation. I remember the first dad I passed this on to, and he's got a fifth grader, and I, I said, hey, how are you guys doing? And he just says, man, it's just tough talking. And so I said, hey, why don't you try this app? And he came back the next Sunday, and he says, this is incredible. <laughs> because he had taken the time to pull it out, and just pro he just needed a, a prompt, just something to kind of get it started. And then he said, we had real conversations this week. And it's just been rich. It's been great. And so what is it? How do we take that time to be able to just engage in conversation when we sit at home? Well, the second one is, is when you walk along the road. And we don't do a lot of walking along the road these days. We're usually in our cars. We're driving off to school or to soccer or some other place. Or we might do some walking. Uh, moms or dads, either one, you're walking through Safeway with the cart and kids are along with you. And there might be a little bit of connected conversation. It's not so much what our conversation is, although that is a, it's a grand opportunity for us to just witness the things that are going on around us and leveraging them with, with God lenses. I hope that it's not like what I witnessed the other day in Safeway. I, I went to do some shopping for my parents, and it was a Friday morning. It's about 9.30, and I'm going through, walking through the aisles here, filling out the baskets, and there was a dad and his two boys and they're just having a great old time going up in the aisles. And as I work my way from one side to the other and back again, because I don't shop that much and I don't know where anything is, so I'm trying to find things. He was kind of in the same boat. And, but everything seemed great until we got to the checkout line. 9.30 in the morning, not a lot of shoppers, but the line was four deep and one checker. And I was number three. And the two people in front of us had big baskets. And this dad, who was having a great time with his kids, all of a sudden the mood changed and he soured and he got angry and irritated and perturbed and then caustic. And he began to say things in the presence of his kids that, oh, I hope that none of you are talking like that in the presence of your kids. And the lens and the filter and what he was giving those kids as they were trying to get through the line at Safeway what is the legacy that he was leaving for them that they find to be their norm? What is their normal? We need to be mindful of the things that we are seeing and saying as we walk along the road. When you're cut off in front of you, do you pray for that person or do you handle it differently? <laughs> Two more, and I've just got a couple of seconds here. When you lie down, it's that wind down into the daytime where you, it's whether it's, it's that evening prayer or a little story time or whatever. And just briefly here, if I can tell you that I've got three kids and I didn't leverage this one until the third one. And I wish I could go back and leverage it with the other two and I can't. But I'm so grateful that I caught it with the third because the relationship that it created was absolutely incredible. Find that time, carve it out. Take advantage of it. Leverage those opportunities in the life of your kids. The final one, it says, and when you rise up, what a great day for us to start their day sending them off with a God perspective, hand a blessing upon their head, hoping that they will go out, recognize that the God who loves them beyond what they could think or imagine is gonna guide and direct them through the day. The embarrassment for me to stand here with that is to tell you that when I thought about this for years, that I should launch into that as my kids came down the stairs and headed out the door, and I never did it. So would you dads, if you've got that opportunity, would you just launch into that and make up for what I missed out on and take advantage of this rising up and sending them out? But in these things here, sitting at home, walking along the road, lying down and rising up, the key here is that we're leveraging situations to savor the love of the Savior, to sync up our activities to his service, and to sense his presence in every situation. And let's remember that faith starts afresh in every generation. Let's do our utmost, whatever we can, to move 
our kids and our grandkids and our neighbor's kids and any other kids God allows us to have influence on into a first generation experienced faith. Uh, he'll be pleased, he'll be honored, and he'll be delighted that you work together with him in that. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would find that we would be families who are leveraging faith with a legacy mindset and a likelihood action plan and lenses of godliness that we look at life through and times of learning that makes an impact on those who come after us. It doesn't matter our age or our stage, Lord, you all give us opportunity to do that. Let us not let it slip by. And we will so celebrate. We will so celebrate when that moves on, generations behind us, even those who have inherited, that they move into a first generation of faith. <laughs> we look forward to those great times that we have that privilege. And we ask for opportunities to do so in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.